Okay. Um, right, so the bipartite graph is input to the simulation. Basically, you have nodes which are people and locations, and there's an edge between them if a person visits a particular location. And the edge is labeled with the, the time of the, of the visit. Um, a feature we plan to add is an additional graph, which is a people-people graph, for things that don't happen, interactions that don't happen at a location. An instance is if you wanted to model information flow as well, so if a person calls another person on a phone, there's not really a location for that interaction. It's a direct interaction between two people. Um, so, so doing this, we can model both time-dependent and location-dependent interactions. Um, we have a scripting language, which I'll show a little snippet of later, that um, to specify the um, the complex interventions that we model. And we have a, 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 PP, a PTTS, which is a probabilistic times transition system. It's basically a finite state machine with um, timed tran uh, transitions and uh, probabilistic transitions to model the, um, the state of the health state of people. So, and this is an example of, of what the the person-person um, the graph um, comes out to be. This is a, a fairly small network, but the way this is done is we start with a single person up here. This first level has all of the contacts of that person. You p pick one of those people, and that's all of their contacts, and then it goes down. Um, and these other edges in here are contacts across and, and up the, the levels. So the, the nodes are laid out fairly nicely, but you can see in the interior it's a mess with all the edges. And that's one of the, the challenges of this work is the, the network we're actually doing the, the um, communication over is, is very complex. And it changes over the course of the simulation. Um, so th qu very quickly the, how the, um, the application works. So each we have um, what we call person managers and location managers. Each one of those is a, uh, a char and char plus plus. And each one of those uh, manages multiple people or multiple locations. Um, since we have so many agents in the simulation, it's a way to have um, a little bit of aggregation before we hand things off to, to char plus um, plus. And then right here, it showed um, these on separate PEs. These could actually be. Um, chars on the same PE. And then this shows the, the processing of a time step. So basically what happens is each person figures out what they're going to do for the day. And for each location that they're going to go, uh, they're going to go to, they send a message, um, a lightweight message that we call an interactor to that location that basically has the time that they're going to arrive, the time they're going to depart, and what their health state is. Um, so basically for for each of these people in parallel, we can generate those messages. We um, use a completion detection synchronization. Um, each location needs to know that it has all the people who have been sent before it can start its processing. Um, then we, we switch phases to the compute infection phase, which is what's going on in the location. And basically, that's a sequential discrete event simulation there's an event for uh, a person arriving at the location and leaving the location. And whenever the, a person leaves, you calculate the interaction between that person and every person who's still located at that location. And if there's a, a person who's um, infectious and a person who's susceptible, then there's a, um, a probability that the, the infectious person will infect the susceptible person. And if that happens, a message is sent back to the person saying, you're infected at this time. And there's another CD synchronization. Basically, each person needs to know, collect all the infection messages that they're going to get, and then they update this, their state. We update the global simulation state. We keep track of things like the total number of infected people in the, in the simulation. And that's, that's basically one, one time step, which is configurable, but, but it's easy to think about it as one simulated day. So, um, the reason we're able to do this is because for, um, especially for human transmitted diseases, there's a latent period. If I become infected, there's a minimum amount of time before, while the viruses build up in my body, before I can infect somebody else. And that's generally longer than 24 hours. 
So we don't have to worry, during a simulated day, we don't have to worry about somebody changing state and then um, cha uh, causing changes in anybody else who, who they um, interact with later in that day. Um, so, like I said, the, um, the, we call this the person location graph. This is the bipartite graph that's um, input into the simulation. Implicitly within the simulation, this gets turned into a person-person graph, which is basically a graph where there's an edge between a person, between two people, if there's a potential interaction between those people. Basically, if they're co-located in the same location at the same time. So these, um, these edges get, um, oh, right. So the reason I, I X that out um, is assuming that, I need, and I need to put times on this graph, assuming that person one and person three were, or I guess all, all three of these um, people are in this location, but person one and person three aren't there at the same time. So person one and per person two overlap, and person two and person three overlap, but person one and person three don't. So there's no edges between, between those people because they're not there at the same time. Um, so basically, this defines the communication in the program. The person-person graph defines the, the computation in the program. And like I said, both graphs um, evolve over time. The size we're talking about for the United States, um, 270 million edges um, and 70 million locations. And that gives us roughly 1.5 billion edges in the person location graph and roughly 75 billion edges um, in the person person graph, which is 75 billion poten potential interactions per time step. And I say potential because if you have two susceptible people in the same location, then there's not an actual interaction that can transmit disease. But it's still something you have to bring those people together to figure out whether the, the potential interaction will turn into an actual interaction that could cause, um, cause a change in the state of the simulation. So um, we also do um, complex inter interventions and combinations of inter interventions. So for instance, we can do vaccination um, with different compliance rates based on the, the subpopulation that they're, they're in, adult children and critical workers, which are things like hospital workers or first responders. Um, we can close and reopen schools. We can do quarantine, which basically just takes a group of people and ships them off somewhere and isolates them from the rest of the community. Self-isolation, which is basically somebody who um, decides to stay home. So they, they still interact with their family members, but they don't interact with anybody else out in the community. And we can do this at um, dynamic time points. So you can close the schools when 1% of the children are um, diagnosed. And then it's not on here, but they reopen when 1 tenth of the, the children in that county are, are diagnosed. And just to give you a, a sense, this is the scripting language that the simulation takes as input to describe these interventions. So none of these are necessarily hard-coded into the, the simulation. They're all part of the, the input configuration. And it's fairly um, self-explanatory. These are the, the scenario variables. You apply this intervention um, to 60% of the people, um, things like that. And this is gives an idea of what the dynamics are when you do that. So these are the, the 16 combinations of those four interventions. This is basically the, the base case if, if nothing happens. Um, so this graph is what we call an epi curve. You have time along the, the um, x-axis and the number of currently infected people along the y-axis. Um, this, this line is interesting. This is a school closure line. You can see it goes up until um, it reaches that trigger, at which point it drops down until you um, reopen the schools, and then it, it heads back up again, but at a much lower peak than this. And this is doing this, even though um, you're basically just delaying things, can also be useful. It gives you time to develop things like vaccines, um, which are, are time consuming to, to create in vo volume enough to, um, to help. And then down here, this just shows the geographic distribution. Each one of these lines is a county. 
um, in the various states and the line starts when the schools close and ends when the schools reopen and these are all based on on those um, percentages that I showed you so this is an idea of what the what the application can do okay so um, so we've been doing uh, some performance um, analysis on blue waters, um, some scaling. Basically, we use Charm++ in SMP mode using the Gemini layer. Um, we use four processes per node. Each process has three compute and one communication thread. Um, and we do application-based message coalescence. Basically, we generate a whole lot of very small messages, so we try and pack them together to um, to cut down on the number of messages in the system. We've also been looking at um, the mesh streamer, I guess you call it TRAM now, that um, is, they're going to talk about later in, the, in this session, um, which helps a lot at, at um, lower core counts, especially with the memory usage. Um, and performance is, is fairly good. Okay, and basically we decided to use, um, to use this configuration based on, on the performance numbers we we ran on blue waters. So um, first, the kind of uninteresting result, weak scaling. Um, basically, these, the difference between these two lines is the static partitioning we did, which I'll talk about in a minute. But basically, it's, it's fairly flat all the way out to, um, this only goes out to 1,600 PE. So we have no, um, we expect, based on the strong scaling results, that, that it'll keep going. We just haven't had time to do the rest of those. Um, so one thing that that running at these large scales pointed out is a problem with task granularity in our system. Basically, the size of the locations, which is the number of people who visit the locations, follows a power law, and the the load uh, compute load by a location basically um, follows the number of people who who visit that location. So th this was the original data, and basically you can see there's five orders of mag magnitude size difference between the smallest locations and the, and the largest locations. Um, so what we did was we took those locations and we split them up into multiple smaller locations that can then be distributed between um, cores, and that gave us a much, um, a much tighter uh, grouping of, of sizes of locations. And that, that really helps. And again, we, this wasn't apparent until we ran at scale because normally um, things just get packed onto a, um, a core and, and you don't really notice. But as you go farther and farther out, then the, the big locations start to stick up. And are, even if they're the only thing that's, that's on a particular process, um, they still take longer than, than the other ones. OK, and so this is the, the strong scaling um, for the United States the entire United States, so 270 million people. Um, the red line is was original data, and the blue line is the the data when we we did this um, splitting of locations. So we we fixed the the task granularity, and then over here we have the the efficiency of the system. So basically, it starts out around one, it jumps up a little bit. We're not completely sure what that is due to. We think it's either um, memory effects or um, network effects. Um, and then it, it's starting to flatten out down here again um, at 200, 280k cores, basically 99% of, of blue waters, um, at about 20%. And as the only other agent-based epidemiological simulation that I could find um, basically got 15% uh, efficiency on 64Ks on a um, XT5. Right, so if, if you look on here, that that's a, um, comes out at about 30% on our, um, our plot. So I think this is, this is very good, yeah. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll talk to that and talk about that in one second. Okay. <coughs> Next, Grim's graph. Okay, so um, round robin is basically how we distribute the um, the person chars and the location chars. 
So there's no attempt at doing any kind of intelligent distribution. They're just kind of um, spread around the system. Um, it's good because it's, it's low overhead. And the way our data is, it, um, we started out doing um, basically metropolitan areas. And it, there's no, no real partitioning you can do on, on something like that. Basically, we use a gravity model for assignments, so any person can basically go to any location within six, a 60 mile radius. So there's not really any clustering or anything on, on small, small regions. But when you go up to entire states or the, the whole um, United States, that's no longer true. You do get these clusters um, where the, the cities are, the pop, basically population density. So we did another. Um, Another thing, yes, we use Metis to partition the graph. Um, we picked Metis because since we have these, these two phases, we, we need something that does multi-constraint partitioning. We want, oops, we want to both balance the, the, um, the people and the location separately because the, basically the computation, computation moves back and forth from one to another. Um, and this is some... Um, some projections results of what happened. So this was the original round robin data. This, uh, and you can see that this is the, the um, task granularity problem. We have these, um, the orange is the, the um, computation on the locations, and these are sticking out. When we um, split those locations, that goes away. And then these lower two are the, um, the Metis partitioned things. So you can see even with the those big um, tasks in there, it does do slightly better and it does much better um, on the, the partitioned, uh, or the split locations. So basically we went down from um, 0.4 seconds per time step to about um, a hundredth of a second per time step. So that was actually um, quite a, an improvement. Okay. Um, one interesting thing that we did find, um, this is the original round robin data um, for, I think, the state of Michigan, which is 10 million people. And if you look at the, and this is the number of bytes received by each processor. And you can see it's, it's fairly even, but there's some, some jitter up here. When we um, run that through Metis, basically the average goes way down, but you have this weird spike here. And that's basically because Metis is optimizing on the, the total edge cut, not necessarily the number of messages that are sent or received by any single processor. And I, I don't think it's clear to us at this point whether this is a significant um, efficiency problem or not. And then along with that, because um, our, our ultimate goal is to scale up to a, a global scale population, which is roughly 10 million people. And we're already about, um, or a little bit past the part, point where Metis can partition these graphs just because the thing is, is just so big. Um, so Jay Sung's been doing some, some good work trying to figure out how to reduce the, the size of the graph that has to be partitioned with, without sacrificing quality. And he found out basically if you, um, if you randomly remove edges from high degree nodes to get it down so that, um, okay, so basically you, um, you can get it down so no, no node has more than 200 um, edges or 120 or 10. Um, at low, um, low no partition numbers, um, it, it does, it, it doesn't do it quite as well, but when you start getting out with, for a large number of partitions, it, that's just as effective as partitioning the, the whole graph, at least with, with Metis. Um, we're not sure how that relates to the, the optimal partition, but um, that, that should help us as we're going forward. Um, and then we've also used um, GPUs to try and accelerate um, epicendemics. This, this was done on um, Pokey speed at Virginia Tech, um, not Blue Waters. The rest of the results were, were from Blue Waters. So basically, the, um, this is the, the location computation. It's the biggest chunk of, of all of it. So that's the, the, 
um, part we tried to move off onto the GPU and you can see we get a quite a bit of um, speed improvement when, when we do that. So basically a seven, almost an eight times, um, eight-fold improvement in, in the speed. Um, and this is, this is basically just comparing um, one GPU process or one CPU process to doing that same amount of work on the GPU. Um, it's a little more difficult when you, when you have multiple GPUs and multiple cores and trying to, to fit that into an existing application. So that's um, the work that Ashwin has been, has been doing or some of the work that he's been doing. Um, so basically, you can, you can either, um, basically all the, all the CPUs try and schedule their work on the, on the GPUs and then the CPUs sit idle while, while the GPUs are going through um, or you can dedicate a couple of um, CPUs to, to do their work on the GPU and then have the, um, the other CPUs operate as normal, which is what, what we're doing. Basically, what, what he's doing is um, some of the, the chars will offload all of the location work to the GPU and other chars will, will do it on the CPU. Um, it's not the way the application is structured, it's not really possible to offload some of the work onto the GPU and do other work on, this, on the same core that's controlling that, that GPU because there's, there's a not insignificant amount of work that has to be done on the, on the CPU as well to um, do the data preparation and stuff. That is something that, that we're looking at. Okay, so, um, so that's what we've, we've done so far. The things with that we, we're going to do um, going forward our work with dynamic load balancing um, that's already underway um, basically we, we want to do prediction based um, load balancing so there's going to be some sharp transitions that aren't um, in the in the simulation especially when you get into these dynamic interventions where um, say say you close a school so then that's going to move a lot of the computation from the locations that have or the the cores that have the the schools on them to where the, the homes are. So by um, taking in some application semantics and um, feeding that into the, the charm load balancer, we should be able to um, to predict when that's going to happen and um, move some some of the load around um, before it becomes a problem. Um, and we also want to try playing with the the charm plus plus meta load balancer, which is a, a new feature that was touched upon yesterday, but basically it's something that decides when the load balancer should be invoked. Um, and some further improvements to the initial partitioning. And then as we get to bigger and bigger data sets, message reduction is going to be very important. Trying to figure out, and this will require some changes to the application and possibly the application semantics, but basically trying to figure out which messages you don't need to send. Um, basically, a, a person is going to the same locations every day, or most of the time that's true, so you don't need to send those me messages each time step. You should be able to figure out which messages you can use already and which messages um, need to be sent because they're different than the, the time step before. Okay, and uh, I think that's all I have. Uh, just a second. Uh, from your description of the application, it sounded very much like a bulk synchronous parallel application that synchronizes the entire machine several times through each time step. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And, okay, I'm kind of surprised then because I thought those applications tended not to scale very well. Is the issue that you are getting all the load balancing from Charm++ Plus Plus, and so you don't get delays because of the extra synchronization, or what do you think the reason is for that? Um, I'm not sure. Um, the one, one definite benefit we have is that we're not um, at least with the message transmission, we're not um, very sensitive to the latency. 
So basically, we send all the messages, and then um, we don't process them until all the, those have been sent and, and received. So nobody's waiting, waiting on that. Um, OK, and the barriers and themselves don't become an issue? I think that part of it is because there's there's so few of them. There's one, there's two per time step, and there's maybe 120 time steps during the course of the simulation. Okay, so your time steps take relatively long in uh, in compute time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? You didn't mention the uh, last bullet bag on the global population, so oh, that's yes. quite a bit more people than yeah. uh, the U.S. population. Uh, so what, what are the technical challenges in that? I imagine gathering data is one of them, but then computationally, right. yeah, how so would that change things? Yeah, gathering data, and, and we're facing this right now. We're, we're actually starting work on, on generating these populations. Um, data loading is going to be an issue. Um, that's already an issue. The it's about a, a hundred gigabytes of, of data for the U.S. population. So if you go multiply that by 20, that's about what we need for the, the global population. So that's a significant amount of data to pull off of the disk. Um, and some of the one thing I didn't mention is we don't run just a single one of these simulations. Um, since this is a stochastic simulation, we have to run um, a few replicates, um, somewhere between 15 and 25, to get a handle on the stochastic variation, and then what we're trying, the answers we're trying to get are not X number of people is going to be infected. It's if you do this set of interventions at this time, it's better than this other set of interventions. So we also have an experimental design we have to go through. So you might have to run a thousand or two thousand of these simulations to get your answer. So what we want to do is be able to read all that data in and then use it a thousand times to, to compute all the answers and try and amortize the, the data load. Um, and the message volume is going to be a problem as well. Yeah. Have you looked into using other graph partitioning libraries like Scotch that might be more flexible about what uh, what metrics they optimize for, like say maximum cut weight rather than average, or you know 95th percentile or something like that. Um, I know that we we've looked into to Scotch, but it doesn't do this multi-constraint partitioning, so that that limits things. Um, so yeah, that that's that's definitely something we'd like to 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 look into, but it, it's a it's a challenging problem. 